Thank you all. Good morning. Um, I know it's not the, the best moment to come to Carl in terms of the, the life that it's in this institution, but uh, thanks for, for being here today. Um, so, um, yeah, we've been, we've been trying to link with the work that is being done here, and um, now it might be that happens that we, we get a project together. But um, we, we've been reading our work back and forth, so it's very nice to be able to, to come back. In fact, uh, um, the paper that just came out on um, transitions and domains to transformation, um, it's pretty much talking with what I'm going to present um, by, uh, I think it's Colin and, and uh, also... Well, there's a few of you that were in that that are on that article. Um, so I'm going to present you more or less the work we've we've done uh, a bit of on a theoretical level. So what I would like to um, share with you then is if you think of uh, an agroecological process that you know that might have some of this. Uh, elements, factors, or drivers that we are talking about. So then we can somehow, if you yourself assess a case that you, that you know, assess in terms of what I'm going to present, so then we can kind of feedback if, if, um, if it actually uh, resembles what, what your experience is in terms of <coughs> agroecological processes in other, in other places. But first I just wanted to quickly say a bit of um, what our our research uh, group does this is in spanish uh, we we haven't got it to to uh, translate it but basically i can tell you a little bit about this um work that is done with uh, school school gardens so there's a lot of uh, um, um capacity building with uh, professors and there's a network uh, that that came up uh, that uh, initially was just a uh, few schools and now it has become a national and an international network that use uh, not only school, school gardens but more of educational gardens as a way of uh, bringing um, <coughs> understanding of agroecology among other, other things but basically having the sensibility of, uh, about diversity and, and the importance of food then uh, we have we've had other project that's mainly with uh, NGOs and uh, community-based organizations sharing their uh, strategies, buildings, uh, food security and sovereignty. Um, we have a lot of work with the students. We we've uh, built up uh, this. We call it the flower of agroecology, which is a conceptual flower, and it uh, goes into different concepts and you can click on it and it's a bit of like a sort of Wikipedia for, for <laughs> agroecology and it uh, brings up a bit of the history of, of authors and social movements that are uh, more or less around this uh, um, pollinated flower of agroecology and uh, also um, we are linked through Peter Rosset's uh, to the processes that Via Campesina is pushing forward with a lot of uh, schools uh, throughout uh, Latin America. So those are uh, a few projects that we are involved in, in terms of, um, of uh, um, action research. Um, and this uh, research that I'm going to present uh, was a revision of of key key examples of uh, massification of agroecology. Um, but before I go into the details of the cases, um, I um, will have this this question. So I don't know if uh, anyone. Uh, has a notion of what could this could be like what what other words can be associated to it does it mainstream. mainstreaming mainstreaming 
scaling that's the most uh, used. No? Uh, so why are we not using scaling? No, it's, uh, scaling becomes quite um, abstract when we work at the village level. So if we say scaling doesn't tell much to farmers, but if we say massification, it does. So it might be something related to the Latin American context. But still, I wanted to bring it because it ends up being a word that comes more from social movements rather than from academia. While scaling is an academic word, massification comes from. So, so we, we keep that, that word a bit on, on purpose, as a, almost like as a political act. But we know that, um, of course, there's many other words that uh, talk about the same, the same things. Scaling has this issue of talking about increasing the size, which is not precisely what we're talking about. We're not talking about bringing uh, the scale of a farm from a small, small scale farming to large scale farming. And we're not necessarily talking about grabbing a successful case to replicate it and then scale it up. No? Although these things are part of a potential process of massification, that's not what we're talking about, no? So these are other words that are there, and we believe that the issue is not so much to discuss which is the right word, no? But actually understand what is the process we're talking about, no? So that's, that's basically um, the importance of why um, we are talking about this, this uh, um, increase in the amount of people that are practicing agroecology in a larger territory. That would be, you know, a very simple way of understanding what massification is. In a slightly more complex um, uh, version of what it is, uh, we're talking about different factors that complement and create a process that is multidimensional, that is multi-level and that changes uh, in time, no? Uh, and it's even multi-directional. So um, some people talk about scaling up and scaling out. So vertical, vertical scaling or horizontal scaling, no? So that's, that tells you a little bit of how the process itself can go in different directions, no? Um, so that's a bit what we, what we theorize no, in terms of what massification of agroecology is. I'm not going to go into what agroecology is because I assume that everyone knows what agroecology is, although it is a contested word and we know that and that's part of what can happen in a process of scaling. No? So I'm going to go very quickly with these images, but it's something that stimulates me a lot how we've gone from the existence of various uh, cases of agroecology throughout the world with a social movement saying, look, we're here, it's important, let's, let's take this seriously. But now we are having other institutions saying agroecology is important, no, let's, let's do something about it, and it scales up, and now we're say we have the FAO saying, oh, apparently, yes, agroecology is very important. That's why we need to have uh, the right for food, the rights of peasants, and then now we have a scaling, scaling agroecology uh, initiative within FAO. We have other actors, no? so to me this is stimulating how many reports are coming up, coming up, so it's not anymore just kind of, okay, wh what we do with agroecology, how can we expand it a little bit? No, we're talking about a process that has taken a scale of, of world discussions, no? of how, how, to, how to change the agri-food system as a whole, how to transform it. No? Um, so even the uh, Catholic Church is involved. No? Uh, clearly, this is very important for Latin America, I don't know how much, how important this could be in, in the African context or the Asian conte context, but definitely in Latin America, as, I, as I'll explain a little bit more, how the liberation theology has been 
part of the process of, of scaling, scaling agroecology, massifying agroecology, because it has been present in all of the cases that we've studied, the, the liberation theology has been there. And this is clearly linked to, to that, uh, that school of, of, of the church, let's say. Uh, it's not a school, but I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm not a Catholic, so I can't say. Uh, and in a other arena, the private sector is creating a, mass, a massive funding, and now it's got the agroecology fund, it's funding uh, action research, it's funding a dip, and they're really going into agroecology. And one starts to wonder exactly what does this imply when large corporations, large money owners, resource owners, uh, start to uh, invest in agroecology. So it's not, <coughs> it's not, um, not simple, and I think that's where a few questions have come up in terms of um, what's going to happen when agroecology is scaled. Because agroecology is grounded, because agroecology is based on, on local traditional knowledge, so how is that going to um, change when you are in a process of moving it in a... How are we doing with time? Tell me. I, don't know. I didn't check the time. So um, we had uh, five cases and we came up with um, analyzing these five cases in Cuba, uh, in Brazil, in, <coughs> in Central America, and in Mexico, we came up with these uh, five uh, key drivers, no? where the, the, social, the social network, the, the organicity, the, the organizational structure was fundamental in order for agroecology uh, to have a, a terrain. No? Uh, but before, so this we, we found, for example, how important it was uh, in, in any of these cases that there was a previous organization. Uh, we, um, so um, we saw also the, the importance of having uh, con con control, con sorry, con constructivist pedagogies, so horizontal processes that these organizations will push forward, particularly we're talking about campesino, a campesino, peasant to, to peasant movement. So that was obviously a, a starting point uh, in, in Central America uh, and it was very clear in Cuba how the exchange of knowledge among farmers in a very horizontal process was fundamental. Uh, this uh, also is linked to the, the process where simple practices are pictured, are understood, and farmers start with simple practices and then move on into other uh, more sophisticated practices. So that's, in terms of the, the transition uh, theory, that's something that we don't, uh, we didn't see enough information to have the precision that, okay, yeah, all of the processes should start with a very simple practice. But it was an more or less clear that, for example, in the, in the Indian case, uh, which is a zero-budget zero natural farming movement that we've studied there, how uh, farmers would start first with a, a, a simple, let's say, uh, compost, you know, using the compost, and then they would be moving into another, another more sophisticated practices. But in terms of scaling, we are asking ourselves, okay, so at what point can you go from the farm level to a landscape level, a territorial level, because that en ends up adding a much more complex need of, of uh, planning and strategy. So that 
part of the, of the scaling of the massification is something that needs to be studied a bit farther in terms of what kind of practices can be, can be scaled. Another aspect is the importance of uh, mobilizing discourse. So, yeah, certainly um, there the, the link between the capacity of being organized and the capacity of mobilizing people is, is interlinked. But here the point is that the discourse has to also uh, communicate with the life of, of the people involved. It, it's, uh, it's that's where the agroecology is talking about uh, the knowledge of farmers. So it has to come from, from below. It has to be a bottom-up process. No? And uh, particularly the Indian case was very interesting because they are mixing a lot of the religious uh, beliefs with the, the, the process of, of uh, sharing the, the practices and the, and the knowledge around ag agroecology. Then there's the other factors which are less of um, internal or, or grounded base and within the process of massification we saw that the kicking point or the sparking point would be a crisis. So it will be very rare to have a, a process of grabbing agroecology if there wasn't a crisis, a conceived crisis. So th I mean there can be a crisis, we're in, in a constant crisis, but there has to be a recognition of this crisis and then the recognition that agroecology is a solution for that crisis. No? But you could have a crisis, but if you don't have the organicity, you wouldn't have a, a reply to this, to this process. No? These other elements, um, we found that they were relatively less important than the others. So we um, more or less realized that these were the, the key elements, the social organization, the effective practices, the con constructivist pedagogy, and the mobilizing discourse. But the, the external allies were very important to mobilize resources, but were not necessarily fundamental in the process. They were very important in terms of mobilizing resources, but it was the, the process was not driven because of the alliances. The alliances were re relevant, <coughs> but the, it was not driven by the alliances. Um, in terms of favor of policies and favor of markets, what we're talking about is how to create conditions so that um, these, these processes spark to a diff another level. And that's where we have, we have questions of, what is really happening with alternative networks. So certainly, uh, for example, the case of Brazil, which is Regi uh, uh, Ecovida, is the, the network of Ecovida, which has gone from uh, a few small farms in a, in a state to have a whole network of, of, uh, of farmers markets in three states with a trading network that goes um, in a, in a circular way, so they have uh, managed to organize all agroecological production where there's trade from one region to another. And certainly that has um, allowed another, so another level of, of, uh, of massification, no? and in a context of favorable policies, because the government was uh, in a moment where they were supporting these kind of initiatives and they were also creating a market space because they, they had the, the go government purchase, uh, there's a different word for, for the government, uh, yeah, the, for the schooling and for all of the of gov government uh, establishments where they would buy food. So clearly that allowed a different kind of, of massification. No? Nevertheless, in the other cases, in, the, in, in, in Cuba, in Central America, and in India, we've, 
we've seen that although they might be important, they are not necessarily the key drivers of a massification process. But this is, if I, if I go back to this, to this, no? to this situation where we are now, where there is many more actors, where there's many more people involved, then our question is if these are not then a, a more relevant uh, component now that the, the story is changing. No? So the, the scaling and the massification is in a, in a different, different situation now. So now I'll pass to Nathan so that we can see uh, as a very concrete example of how uh, this framework has been taken by Nathan to see a particular example and how he has questioned a bit of this uh, hypothesis. Okay, so get That? Yeah. Okay. So, hi, I'm Nathan. Um, I'm a doctorate student at EcoSUR. Mateo is one of my committee members, and we just, it's kind of by chance that we're in uh, England at the same time. <coughs> and he asked me to come up and, and help out a little bit with the presentation. So, this was a presentation that I gave um, a couple weeks ago <coughs> at the Countryside and Community Research Institute in, in Cheltenham. And it's actually a much, it's a it's about like 45 minutes, so I'm going to fly through a bunch of slides and just kind of give the, the bare bones um, analysis and context of my work. Um, so what time is it right now, just so I know? Uh, oh, I got a clock Ten. right there. Okay, so I'll take about 15 minutes or so, if that's all right. Ten. <coughs> okay, uh, 10. <laughs> all right, so um, yeah, so... My, I work in the uh, Maya Chi territory of Guatemala and um, looking at the social processes behind scaling in this uh, certain region. And um, that's a, just a really basic map that took me way too long to make. Um, <laughs> giving you kind of an idea, it's in the central part of the t country there, very rural. Um, and um, about 100,000 Chi speakers in the whole territory. Um, so you. Always when I talk about this first, I have to uh, give, a, give a, a little bit of a contextual uh, uh, framework, kind of situational, what, what's going on there. This is a photo that I took from my master's in 2009 um, in a commemoration for one of the worst massacres in the country that happened in 1982. Um, and it's just kind of a, it's an emblematic case, but a lot of these survivors here are now part of the agroecological movement, um, which I was starting to notice 10 years ago when I was looking at the impacts from um, the massacres, which also coincided with a large hydroelectric dam and uh, massive displacements. Um, so in the long talk, I, I talk a lot about this specific case because it's pretty relevant. But here I'll just kind of blaze through. You can see mass graves, relocation communities, um, survivors, and really terrible conditions that were once pretty self-sufficient in some amazing farmland that's been flooded out. Um, some people trying to recuperate practices um, under really, really challenging situation. Um, and then people who, are, who have actually moved back above the, the, the floodwaters there, figuring that their lives would be better even in really marginal farmland uh, than actually living in relocation and having to find jobs that don't exist or, or migrating to the United States in a good scenario, actually. Um, so back in, in, in the area there where I'm working, Robbie Nall, um, what, I, what I noticed was people f from my master's, which was looking at the impacts of this kind of displacement, uh, people who had returned to planting their crops at whatever level were, were recuperating um, much faster than, than, than other people. That was my, the result of my thesis. And some of it had to do with just uh, recovering uh, crops, you know, um, ancestral practices, uh, I, you know, which runs in, in uh, with the Id identity and a lot have been written about this in Guatemala and other places. Um, 
And I started working with this man right here, Cristobal, uh, on, a, on a farm that he had, he had uh, created to help recover his community uh, through, through teaching agroecological or ancestral farming practices and recovering varieties. Um, so at this point, I started meeting folks in the group there, Menekosur, um, and thinking about where my case might fit into this, this broad um, idea about why scaling occurs. And this is a, the seminal article that Mateo and his colleagues and my supervisor, uh, Helda Morales, published um, a couple of years ago now, um, looking at these emblematic cases. And we started thinking about how I could plant a question where I work, um, looking at these drivers that he discussed earlier, um, which a lot in the case where I work doesn't really apply. Um, social organization is fractured. Uh, constructivist learning processes is a little bit. Um, mobilizing discourses, yeah, but not big grand leaders. External allies, not so much. Federal markets, no. Federal policies, zero. Um, so that was the basis of my, my research. Why is scaling happening here, which I'm seeing uh, over the past few years? A lot of people adopting, a lot of people maintaining practices when all, a lot of these factors don't exist. Um, so I kind of titled it Agroecology on the Periphery, right? And um, hit the ground uh, looking at all the different factors that, that are combined to make this possible. Um, and I was trailing a lot of this group, uh, Asociación Quechua Lum, which means Mother Earth in Achi, um, which is a, a bit of a farmer to farmer group, but more technical assistance to mostly widows um, who want to become part of this group, sell seeds, sell products, and recuperate um, crops such as amaranth here and diversified milpa, corn bean squash there. Um, I worked with a variety. This is kind of just going through my methods, which I'll skip. Um, just working with a variety of people, right? In, in a variety of organizations, um, which I really had no idea existed. My hypothesis, which I forgot to mention, had to do, I was thinking it was cultural recovery these people wanted, and that's why agroecology was just firing away. After a year there, I, it became a lot more um, complex than that, right? Um, first of all, I had no idea that there was external organizations working there on agroecology. This is just a preliminary list of groups. Um, there's probably more like double or triple this, but um, since the peace accords in 96, uh, NGOs have really come into this area promoting agroecology or agroecological practices as a way to, for food security, for uh, re recovering the society which has been so devastated. Um, and <coughs> the organizations, this is part of my results, are perceived as both the driver and barrier to scaling, right? On one hand, you have the introduction of new varieties that people are taking up um, sustainable techniques, mukuna, which is a green manure which didn't exist there, and now probably about half the people I work with are using it because it works. Um, composting was not really happening there at the scale that happens now. Um, accompaniment and training. But you also see tensions between local and external groups over methodologies um, that are viewed as asistencialista or aid-based. Um, groups will go in there for one to two years. Um, offer assistance or money or food for, for farmers to adopt their practices and then they leave and the farmer is just kind of waiting for the next proyecto to <coughs> arrive. Uh, it can be extremely demotivating, it provokes dependency and continued fragmentation amongst neighbors and communities. Um, these are just some direct quotes which I'll skip for sake of time, um, but it just kind of goes to um, detail the different perspectives of what these groups are doing as they come in um, and what a lot of local leaders say is kind of demolish the local movement um, unfortunately. Cultural change and recovery was definitely a part of it not as huge as I once thought um, there's definitely a movement to recover crops but what I found and what I'm really leaning or leaning towards my emphasis now is looking at people who haven't adopted anything they just didn't lose what they had before um, which are few. Uh, this man who's 90 years old now and showing me his varieties of corn 
which survived one of the worst droughts in their history last year um, because of these practices that they just never lost. Um, cultural change is a major factor. Youth don't want to grow food uh, there so much anymore. It doesn't make sense. There's terrible droughts. This is just from last month. Total devastation in the lower part of the, um, the territory. Just no rain uh, during the wet season at all. Um, search for alternatives and economic benefits was huge. Um, people giving the opportunity to become more self-sufficient, grow nutritious food, <coughs> not be dependent on agrochemicals, not de be dependent on buying um, food at the grocery store or even at the market is a huge attraction. Um, diversifying their plots. Uh, this guy's got probably, I don't know, 60 or 70 species of plants, food plants on his two acre plot um, before he just had milpa. It's a, it's a huge draw. Um, nice. This is, you know, this is a picture from last month up in the highlands where this farmer decided to do his own experiment. Agroecological with agrochemicals. So what's going on here? You have an unbelievable crop with very little rain. You have a huge amount of soil, uh, organic matter, moisture in the soil, and no weeding. On this side, fertilizer, herbicides, and uh, no mulching. He sees the results, and people come in with this guy, the promotor, with his apparato A. Oh, shoot. Uh, Is it? <laughs> oh. And uh, you have you know, <laughs> some, some interesting uh, evidence that can be shared with other farmers. Um, so the end of my, my results, can agroecology be scaled on the periphery as is exemplified in the Anchi territory? Yeah, we, we believe it's possible. Um, and it, largely due to the pursuit for greater independence and autonomy, along with the resolve by certain sectors of the population to recuperate cultural attributes damaged or lost during the conflict, particularly those relating to agricultural practices and local varieties. And uh, we published uh, this article earlier this year. And um, just a quick note, uh, I, I, I'm waiting for my revisions on this second article, which is kind of a spin-off, it's not exactly. But it, it's kind of where I'm, le where I'm going with this research and looking at agroecology is not just practices, but it's a, it's a way of life for these people. And the term Utsil Kaslim uh, in, encapsulates this. It's, it's a term for buen vivir or well-being in Achi. And it really, it speaks to agriculture, it speaks to food, it speaks to the relationship that farmers carry with the products that they grow and the land that they use. Um, it's about relationships, it's about reciprocity. And for me, it's you know, what this guy calls la esencia de la agroecología achi. Um, it's not about worm compost. It's about all these different factors. It's about religion. Um, it's super interesting and uh, relevant, I think, just thinking about uh, ideas of progress <laughs> and um, development in this community. So uh, this was just kind of a spin-off article. And then to finish up my thesis, I'm really deepening in on the topic of soil management um, and also just talking again about how it's not just about one practice that can be brought in. in in order for, uh, for success to happen in these groups, they need to look at agroecology as a whole system. Um, and uh, I hope to finish this up here in England uh, next month. And uh, that's my talk for today. <laughs> <laughs>